Well, like when I was in, in medical biomed, we did a lot of Fourier transforms for doing brain scanners. So I'm, I'm somewhat comfortable with, with FFTs. And when I looked up the, the, uh, the, the meaning of the uh, momentum space, it sounded like it was just a, a uh, 2D transform like we're doing in computerized tomography. Mm -hmm. Although I don't know when you're using a four-dimensional time-space transform, but but all your diagrams with the toroid are three-dimensional, right? right? And so I thought yeah. that must be transforming into a sphere. But when I look yeah. on the internet for any transforms from a sphere to a toroid, I couldn't find any anyone mentioning that. Is that the case? Um, well, from a sphere to a toroid, no. But from a hypersphere to a toroid, yes. yes. So you want to be going looking for transformations of hypersphere. So, um, however, it's not just as simple as as just that. The thing is that um, first of all, if you're looking in solid state physics, you look you often work in K space, which is momentum space. H bar K is the momentum. So you have a three dimensional in a crystal. You have a three dimensional lattice, mm -hmm. and that three lattice has a periodicity, a Fourier periodicity, which is different in different directions. If you imagine just a, just a square lattice, and the lattice spacing is different if you look along the sides of the square, or if you look on the diagonal on the base of the square, or if you look on the body diagonal, the, mm -hmm. um, the, um, the, uh, the distance between atoms is different. And it's different in all sorts of directions. And what you end up is you end up with a three-dimensional, well, like, I suppose it is a Fourier tree like a Fourier transform, which is um, called the K space or the uh, momentum space of that crystal. Now, when you're looking at electrons in crystals, you're thinking about uh, electrons being quasi-particles in such crystals. So if you're in a, um, a metal, those uh, electrons, the valence electrons, there's roughly the same number of them as there are atoms. And then the, um, the Fermi wavelength, the um, the wavelength of the electrons is comparable with the intratomic spacing. But in um, technologically interesting things, such as semiconductors, the, um, the wavelength of the electrons are much sparser, uh, and hence the ones that you're dealing with at the edge of the conduction band are uh, quantum mechanically, but also actually very much larger than the intratomic spacing. One sitting they're, there, they're much bigger than the intratomic spacing. So electrons in a, in a semiconductor crystal are typically tens of nanometers in size, where the intratomic space right. is typically angstrom, measured in angstroms. So, so the, the, there are 100 times the length and there are a million times the volume of an atom. So the electrons are simply huge compared to atoms. And it doesn't make much sense to say the electron is associated with a particular atom or even a particular impurity, because if you have an impurity in the crystal, you might have, if you dope a semiconductor crystal, they're fairly good at insulators. So what, what, makes them, what makes them larger? Because we were discussing last Sunday how the electrons actually get smaller as they go up. As they go up in energy. It's, it's their, um, it's their, it's, well. Oh, that's right. Those are energy diagrams, aren't they? That they're showing yes. in, in double E books. As you increase the energy, they get smaller. But as you decrease the energy, they get larger. Now, so when they go they, when they, they go into the valence band, their energy is high. It's not quite just as simple as that. Um, uh, th these bands have a relationship between energy and momentum, just like in free space, energy momentum is quadra uh, relation is quadratic, e equals mm -hmm. a half m e e equals p squared over two, p being the momentum. So, so, so that thing then has a quadratic dependence on uh, on, on energy in free space. That's that's the um, that's the classical momentum, of course, half mv squared. Which, if you look at the total energy of energy momentum of a, of a relativistic electron, is the second term of the expansion. So, if you expand this stuff out, you get mc squared plus a half mv squared plus terms going further in in, in that. So, if you look at a Dirac electron, it's got these two sets of terms. But what matters is that dispersion relation because you're talking about putting energy into a system and that energy ends up as a momentum as the electron moving and it has a momentum mm -hmm. but, but but that electron in a crystal is not on one atom it's not a, it's not a little ball running through 
a little featureless ball running through the crystal. It's something which is embedded in the crystal. And the crystal is a matrix of positive charges and a positive cause surrounded by seas of electrons. Those electrons fill up um, bands. And most of those bands arise originally from the energy shells of the atoms. So if you start with an atom and then you put another atom next to it, the atoms bind to form a molecule. Right. What happens is the energy deficit comes from that. And what you end up with is you end up with electrons that are, that are quote, in the chemistry textbooks, shared between the two atoms. The actual thing is a resonant harmonic electron which goes around both atoms in the outer shell that's responsible for the binding quantum mechanically if you look at the advanced chemistry textbooks. Kind of like a uh, molecule of benzene, the electrons are bouncing yeah, around. Benzene, for example. Now, the, the electrons in... The outer electrons in benzene are distributed across the whole molecule. They're not associated with a specific atom. Right. They're much so the electron is much bigger. I, 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 we humans tend to think of it as going just round around like a little little electron point. But it really just isn't. The electron is really the size of the molecule. And 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 th then you go from a molecule to an arrangement of molecules. A big molecule, or a macro molecule, or if you go in, 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 into uh, into graphene, you have a two-dimensional array of stuff, and you have electrons confined to a two-dimensional crystal. If you go to silicon, bulk silicon, then there it's a three-dimensional crystal. So, um, and all of those dimensionalities, up to three anyway, have a case space associated with them. So, and that case space is, is a relationship between energy and momentum. So, in, at its simplest, that would be quadratic. E is equal to some constant times um, momentum squared. But actually, in practice, it almost never is quadratic. If you, if you look in a textbook on solid state physics, you'll find band structures for all of these common materials, and they do everything. Quadratic one gives you energy minimum at zero velocity. Now, that happens in some semiconductor crystals, in what are called direct band gap semiconductor crystals that are used for lasers and stuff. But it doesn't happen in silicon, in silicon, the minimum is actually somewhere else. It's not at zero. So, um, so, um, so, and, and, and the bad shapes are really quite amazing. They're multidimensional. They're multidimensional in two spaces. Uh, one space is the space of the crystal. So the electrons are moving around in the crystal and are arranged in the crystal in some way. And the other one is they're arranged in momentum space. They, 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 they have a relationship in energy momentum space. Now, what happens at absolute zero temperature, of course, all the electrons fall down to the lowest possible energy level, which may or may not be at a zero of velocity. In fact, in silicon, it isn't. The valence band there is somewhere else. The electrons have a lower energy when they're, quote, moving than when they're stationary. So, um, so and that means the, uh, the silicon isn't a direct band gap. It means that the electrons can't, if you promote an electron in, in, uh, in pure silicon, to the valence band in pure silicon, there's nothing in the valence band, and, or not much in the valence band at very low temperatures, almost nothing, nothing in fact, at, at absolute zero. But if you promote an electron, it can't fall down and emit a photon. And the reason it can't do that is because um, it can't, um, because there's the, the conservation of energy and momentum for the, for the photon. It's got the energy, but it can't match the momentum. It needs to match it with something else and have a third particle, a photon, or something like that. Which carries away the excess momentum. So we're talking we're talking in a three-dimensional space, which is not the space of space, but is the space of momentum. And that three-dimensional space has a shape, and that shape is called the band structure. So that case, so you're now sitting in a space. Look, Pete, I can't explain the whole of solid state physics to you in, in a Yeah, in I, a I was reading it in the bathtub earlier and I'm always trying to catch up on it. There's a lot to know here. It's not. A, it's not a simple thing. So, so but, uh, okay. So that's one thing. Good morning, it is. Hello. We're just talking about momentum space and the difference between momentum space and real space. Oh, cool. Um, so, the, the momentum space. So, when you're thinking in solid state, a lot of your thinking is in terms of the momentum space that you're sitting in, because it's the momentum space that governs the way that um, thing that the thing interacts electronically. 
So what is momentum space? Well, momentum space is, is a 3D space. So, so if you have a particle, which is somewhere in space, you can say, okay, it's X, Y, Z. I can give three dimensions of where it is. But then I can give another three dimensions of which direction it's, of which momentum it has. You can have momentum in X, momentum in Y, momentum in Z. So I've characterized that, that, that featureless particle by having six degrees of freedom. It's a six dimensional space you're sitting in, three of space and three of momentum space. And you can have place uh, particles at the same point in that space with different momenta. And you can have particles at, at um, different points in space with the same momentum. And what you have in a crystal is at absolute zero temperatures, you have a lot of electrons at the same point in momentum space at the lowest energy, but distributed throughout the crystal, depending on the density in something that might be a Wigner crystal at absolute uh, zero temperature. But the point is, this is a separate space to space space. It's a completely separate so, space. So it's, not, it's, not the two, it's not the two or 3D transform. It's not FFT. There's no, uh, direct, well, there's no relationship between the four and transform. Is. No, it's not, because FFT is between time and inverse time, between right. time and frequency. And this is, and, and here you're talking about momentum space, which has elements of both space and time in it. So what Garnet right. was talking about before, it's really a set of areas, not a set of lines at momentum space. Now, okay, so, but look, we could say, okay, well, there's something else the particle could be doing if it's traveling through space. It's got 3D space where it is X, Y, Z. It's got 3D of momentum, momentum in X, momentum in Y, and momentum in Z. But it could also be spinning about some axis. It could also be spinning like a photon does, like a an electron does it could also be spinning and there are another three d's of spin space be spinning about x spinning about y spinning about z so it might be in the x position with a y momentum with a z spin now what does that mean it doesn't mean that the momentum and the um spin are actually in z the momentum is in the um, if the momentum is in Y, the, the, the actual momentum is in the YT plane. It's a combination of space and time because it's D space by D time. Well, velocity is D space by D time and momentum is related to velocity. So it's D space by D time. So you're, so you're sitting in a different space, in a, in a different 3D space of that momentum. But at the same time, it's spinning about the Z axis. Now, what does that mean? That means that it is perfectly everywhere except in Z. The Z axis is a perpendicular axis to the spin. The spin is in the X, Y, T plane. It's a three-dimensional thing because it's, 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 it's spinning. It has momentum in some direction, which is continuously changing because it's going round and round in circles. So its momentum isn't defined in any one direction. It's defined as a circulation in the plane. And that circulation of plane is self-defined, so it's, it's kind of moving out here, and then it's moving around a perpendicular vector. So it has space, space, time. It's a volume. It's a three volume, but it's a space, space, time volume spin. And that's yet another three space. So we're up to nine. Now at this point, human brains just go tilt and my God, you know, thinking in nine, thinking in four dimensions. And I've been practicing all my life to to walk around cubes and think about spheres is very difficult for a human. And very, I get completely lost even just in, in a tesseract, which is not, which is the simplest for the object, just a, a hypercube. Although I can imagine walking around them in a sense. John, can I interject for a moment here? Yeah. You say nine dimensions, but are you not yeah. simply talking about the, rig the four dimensions that we're talking about, X, Y, Z, and T, but in different combinations of them that are happening simultaneously, kind of superimposed upon one another. It's not like there's nine dimensions. There's only four. But you're looking at them in different combinations, superimposed on one another, right? They are related. Yeah. Not, not quite. It is, it is more complicated than thinking like that. It's, it really yeah, is. If you're saying an X, like an X versus time plane is not the same as an X versus Y plane, no, but they are still in that sub. That's they are still a subset of X, Y, Z, and T. No, they are. Uh, Arnie, your your point is very well taken, and you're absolutely correct. We really need two words for dimensions, um, and dimensions. Uh, the, the the thing is, 
dimension dimension means too many things in English. When I say spin spaces, so it, we, we could distinguish it by talking about base dimensions. And the base dimensions are four, they're X, Y, Z, T. And we could distinguish the other ones by saying derived dimensions. But the point is that the derived dimensions are... Combined dimensions. Combinations. Yeah. Yes, but the thing is that these dimensions have properties that one relates to dimensionality. No, I'm not taking issue with that. I'm saying that oh, no, no, no. when we say wow. that we have nine dimensions, now, you know, then the string theorists come along who have these ten dimensions and say, you see, you also have nine dimensions. Why are you giving me a hard time about having all these dimensions? You see what I'm saying? Because we, we, it's not the same thing. Yeah. It's a semantic, it's, maybe it's a semantic issue. But that's, but that's having extra dimensions of space rather than having the kind of derived dimensions that John's talking about. So that's the, well, the differences between kind of the dimensionality of space-time versus these extra dimensions that do other things. Yeah, it is right in that the, 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 the 11 dimensions in the string theory are fundamental to the string theorists. But, you know, some of these dimensions are things like energy, you know, things that have some sort of meaning. Others are so-called rolled up, as in this is talking about dimensions in some sort of space that you never see. And that's where you put a lot of your symmetries in things, string theories, whether they say from any of these dastardly experimentalists to ever have a look at. Um, so, so, so um, but no, this is a different sort of thing because the, the problem with dimensionality is it isn't even two things, it's about five or six different things. And, and, and yeah, you, it, it sounds like I'm trying to obfuscate the thing here, but actually it is, I could sit there and talk to I'm, I'm satisfied with the distinction between base dimensions and derived dimensions, that satisfied me. Okay, it's not enough, Arnie, because I need to blow your mind up a little bit more before you've got the picture. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, my friend, it's, it's horrible. The point is, there are sets of dimensions. These are, these are the zets Dennis is talking about some of these things. They come in threes and ones. And in our algebra, there are four sets of threes and four ones. Now, you can divide those things up in different ways. You can divide them up in the natural way, which is the number of indices, one index, two indices, uh, lines, planes, volumes, hypervolume, a scalar, which is what I, I have been doing. But you can also divide them up in these zets. Now, why, why would you want to do that in these things that Innes is talking about and is going to talk about in the talk coming up? Uh, I feel you're coming on for two talks here, Innes, because there's one on the uh, algebra, there's another one on your zets. <laughs> Sorry about that, sunshine. <laughs> But, yeah, I was realizing that. <laughs> you, you things, this is what happens. So, anyway, but the thing is that these three dimensionalities under rotations, and rotation is a dimensional thing, you think about you know, X rotating to Y, one dimension going into a perpendicular direction. The thing about these four sets of dimensions is they all do the same thing. If you have something which is X and rotated to Y, fine, you have a method for doing that. So it's a sandwich. It's a, or hitting it from the left with a with an e one two with a with a with a rotor. But if you if you have something which is associated with that x direction, for example, the electric field in the x direction, and do the same thing to it, it also rotates in exactly the same way. So it changes from dimensionality of being e x to being e y, and magnetic field does the same thing b x to b y, and spin does the same thing b uh, spin s x to s y. So that aspect of dimensionality, which is described by rotating things, um, works the same for all of these sets. So in that sense, these sets are separate dimensions. They're operated on by a dimensionality, which is sitting in the 1-2 plane, which is the dimensionality of 1-2 rotations. However, if you hit them with a boost, then different sorts of things happen, and then they transform in a planar way. They transform perpendicular to the transformation. So Lorentz, tran so um, so, uh, and, and then I think at least two of them transform in opposite ways: the electric and magnetic field under multiplication transform in opposite directions, left-handed and right-handed. So, um, so, but there's a distinction between. So dimensionality is used quite loosely in, and and, and it's too loose a term. The things are in different dimensions in that they are linearly independent of one another. 
So what does that mean? It means that you can't add any amount of Xness to get an X minus. You can't imagine any, add any amount of length to get any amount of area. You keep on adding as much length as you like. You never get any area. So, so you have unit lengths, and you also have unit areas. These things are both unit objects, which have properties in common, like such as rotation. And in, in terms of addition, you know, one plus one equals two for these things. Uh, one meter plus one meter equals two meters. One square meter plus one square meter equals two square meters, et cetera, et cetera. However, they have different properties under multiplication and they have different properties under transformation. So they're really different sorts of objects. They're different dimensionalities in the sense that you, you can make one out of the other, but only if you define a thing called multiplication or division. So it's not true what I really say that there are only four dimensions because you've got the dimension of multiplication, you've got the dimension of division. But they're not dimensions in the same sense as this because they're not additive. I mean, multiplication is an additive. Well, okay, fair enough. Fairly obvious, but uh, but multiplication of perpendicular lengths is not is not additive. If, if, if I do one by one and add it to one by one, I get two. But if I do if I do two times two, I get four. It goes quadratically. So um, so you, you're changing the the um, dimensionality and you're changing the properties of these things so but come back to Pete's question he's been saying you know what am I talking about here by doing projections I'm talking about projecting an energy density projecting where the center of mass is if you want to calculate the center of mass of an object you have to say where is the mass uh, or where is or a, a better word here is the center of momentum of an object where's the center of momentum of this object so now, now one has to start doing some serious thinking if you're going to do a, what I've called a projection. It's not really a projection. It's really a calculation, if you like, of, of what's happening with the center of momentum. Now one has to start thinking about stuff going around and around in circles. First of all, when you plot the plot I show in momentum space, the reason I say that it's in a different space is because none of the dimensions in the plot are x, y, and z. But but they are originally when you've got the two photons going towards each other they they are they are in normal linear space. They're no, not they're not. Space. No, they're not. They're already they're not. They're already not. Oh, they're already in space. You see them in space, and you see them going from A to B. But the photon sees no space, it's traveling at the speed of light. You're looking at it the at the photon, not not. You're not necessarily no, looking. No, 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 I'm talking about photons because. Yeah. You see, this is a confusion which everybody has and which you have to get past. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry to do that. The, the photon is not something which goes do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it along in time. It doesn't do that. Looks like People it. Think, <laughs> I know it's like it. I know it's in all the textbooks. I know that most professors of physics thinks that it does that. I know that everybody who writes anything about Alice and Bob thinks it does that. There are entire fields of physics where people presume that things go do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it along in time. That's bullshit. It's not proper thinking. These guys have not got the brain switched on when they're doing that. Why? Because the photon and, and even, even the magnificent and wonderful um, Garnet yesterday was doing exactly that. He was defining an object tau, which is the proper time, and calling it the square root of t squared minus x squared. Now, at light speed, t squared minus x squared, or ct squared properly, if you put them into meter units, ct squared minus x squared is precisely zero for every it stays at the same point in its path the entire path is at the same point it isn't really moving it's really ex, it's really created and destroyed at the same point in space time how do it's i visualize then a photon leaving the earth and going to the moon bouncing off and coming back if it's not moving well, like a wiggle through space uh, you have to think at the same time as you, who sees it going and coming back uh, half a second later. Yeah. It's about a quarter of a light second from the moon. And you have to think as the photon and what it sees. What the photon sees is the emission, the mirror on the moon, and the absorber uh, in your lab being at the same point. Why do point I as look at it from the perspective of the photon? Why can't I look at it from my perspective? You can look at it from the perspective of the photon, but when you draw a photon diagram, you have to realize that the diagrams you're that the stuff you're drawing in the photon diagram is not space and time for the photon. Because the photons, 
the photon's momentum defines its its energy momentum, its energy and momentum are related. So its energy defines momentum. The energy is given by the energy of the photon. The um, momentum is given by that divided by C, it's energy divided by the speed of light, is its momentum. So the two things are, are linked absolutely to one another by a simple equation. But when you draw a photon, you're drawing it, the, the photon is moving in momentum space. The photon's in momentum space. The, the thing that distinguishes one photon from another is not how fast it goes, they all go the same speed, but how much momentum it has. They all have the same velocity, and that velocity is such that space and time are crunched to nothing. And this is hard to that's, understand. That's, this only in its, that's only from its perspective, but from my perspective, it has a wavelength. That's right, it has a wavelength because you consist of a bunch of ruler clocks which you're using to measure it with. And for you, it has a, it has a wavelength, and it has a, a distance, and it has a, a speed which it travels, which is the speed of light. And it's going to have to vibrate so many times before it gets to the moon. In your frame, that's what it does. In somebody right. else's frame, it, it, and in everybody's frame, it vibrates the same number of times. But in, in different... So, in, so why is it not correct to look at the photon? Is this wave ziggling for half a second till it gets to the moon and ziggling back? Why is that not correct way of looking at it? It is a perfectly correct way of looking at it, but it is not the full story. You, okay. You're looking at, you're looking at it. Well, not as a cave human would look at it, because cavemen wouldn't know that sort of thing. But you're looking at it as you look at it the first time you meet light, and and without thinking through the whole consequences of the theory of relativity. Now, that that's not a criticism in any way. I mean, who the hell can do that? You know, as we say in Scotland, there's very few, and there are deep, which means there are very few, and most of them have died by now, right? So, so there are very few people who, who think about photons the way that I think about photons. And it's not an easy thing to do. But when, you draw, when I draw that diagram, the diagram with the two photons coming in and looping up into two things, there isn't a single dimension in that picture that is the dimension of space. There is no space there. Now, everybody sees space, and people criticize me. I've had referees come back and say, everybody knows this photon, the electron isn't a little donut going round and round in space. You're wrong. Now, everybody includes me. I know that the, that the electron is not a little donut going round and round in space. It's not a little thing going dee -dee 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 round a donut in space. But you see, the thing is that if I'm going to draw something in a multi-dimensional space, and there are nine dimensions in that diagram that I've drawn. Not three, nine. Three dimensions are the three dimensions of the electric field. And the electric field goes round and round in electric field space in 3D. So it follows a path in electric field space. And that path is a toroidal path in momentum space. Now, where's the momentum coming from? Okay, but the magnetic field also does the same. Well, it doesn't actually. It stays in one direction in that thing, pretty much. It wobbles a little bit, but it stays pretty much up. So it stays pretty much in one direction, say the Z direction, if you like. So, um, but, but nonetheless, in principle, it could have a 3D, and it does have a 3D in reality, because I think the, the whole model has to tumble precisely to cancel that field. But the, but the um, magnetic field has its own 3D space, and it's a different 3D space. Sorry, 3 DD space, double D space. No bad thoughts, gentlemen. Double D space is derived dimensional space. Right. Okay. So, so, so it's sitting in the magnetic field drawn in a derived dimension, which is the magnetic field dimension. The electric field sitting in another derived dimension, which is a, an area, which is a space time area space. What Garnet was talking about yesterday. That's another three dimensional space, another double D space. Now the momentum sitting in a third space, in momentum space, which is a product of E and V. Now that's momentum space. That's a more familiar space to me as a solid state physicist, because I've been using it all my life for thinking about crystals. But that's yet another space. Although it has the same multivector form as the electric field, it's at a different level to the electric field. The electric field is a square root quantity. And the momentum is a squared quantity. It's field electric multiplied by field magnetic that's field times field 
So it's different. Um, it's a different. Um, it's momentum. It's not electric field. Electric field and momentum have different dimensions, other than in the same sort of direction. Like force and flow have the same vector component, but they are different dimensions. Force in newtons, flow in kilograms per square meter, or whatever. So, so, but the diagram is not drawn in space space. The problem is, of course, that everybody who sees, nearly everybody who sees it, it doesn't have another space to think in. So they see it as being something which I'm drawing going around around in circles, including, for example, some of our esteemed colleagues like Viv. So, so Viv really does see the thing that's going around and around in circles in the models and the theories that he's creating. So, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that, but that is not what I'm drawing. That is not what I'm drawing. So, um, so the mass in the MV that you're using is based on the energy of the photon. It's based on the momentum. The momentum. I'm, no, you, I, yeah, it's the, the momentum is the mass times the velocity. And the mass uh, you're using is the. Is no, the no, mass no, momentum, the momentum is not mass times velocity just, although that's a good approximation for momentum in slow speeds. Uh, a momentum is given by mass times velocity, but the momentum of light is given by energy divided by the speed of light. Mass has ma mass has no uh, light has no rest mass, so you can't do mv for it's not mass of the photon times c. It's energy of the photon divided by c for a, for for light. Right. right. For a material particle at low speeds, yes, you have. Um, Momentum is given by m times v, and you can calculate the momentum at higher speeds by looking at the change in mass. So allowing that change in mass to go as one over, well, the relativistic correction factor, one over square root of one minus v squared over square root of v, one minus v squared over c squared. You have this relativistic correction, which now momentum of material particles can go to infinity. It's a vector, like velocity, but momentum. What's, what's the added. advantage of having these? differentiating masses, these two types of mass. I, I, the more I, I read your stuff and Martin's stuff, the more I got the impression there's really only one type of mass. And it's just that, 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 That's it's right. A, a mass is anything that's confined to a particle. It doesn't matter what sort of stuff goes in. If you put heat in, if you put photons in, if you put spin in, if you put any kind of energy you put in, you can weigh on a scale. So in that sense, anything confined leads to something that you measure as mass on a scale that you can weigh in a gravitational field. So, um, so um, yes, that's absolutely so. But it doesn't mean that there aren't different sorts of mass. You know, there's mass which is just um, stationary, which transforms like, a, like an invariant. There's mass that transforms like a spin. There's, 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 there's energy in spin. There's energy in the... In, uh, in 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 a photon in 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 a bivector electric and magnetic field, so but any of those things will lead to mass on a scale. So that's true, but it doesn't mean there's any one kind of stuff. Uh, if you've not had a chance to see my, two I've never even on thought that the spin, the the energy that's in us or the mass. I always thought that the the energy in the spin is off the energy of the of the individual atoms, and so yeah, I don't know but why they're such a thing as, mo as mass of spin. It seems like spin is just property of particles moving, and the particles moving are, are what's, the mass is what's moving. Why does spin impart mass? Well, it imparts energy. Uh, and if yes, you look at that, does it? Yeah, that's mass. In fact, so the thing is, you've got to be careful not to double count the mass. So if you think of something spinning being a little mass going around around in circles, that's not, okay, you can get angular momentum like that, but that's not how spin works. Spin is an intrinsic rotation of stuff, and all of the mass of a photon is accounted for by its spin. All of it. E is H nu. The energy is given by the spin of the photon. It's not given by the mass of the photon because it's rest massless. It's rest massless. That's different to saying that it's massless. It has a mass associated with its energy, E equals mc squared. You're if saying you if the photon didn't have spin, that it wouldn't have mass. 
I'm saying that as its spin goes to zero, its mass goes to zero, yes, but also the photon goes to nothing at all, it goes to oblivion. But photons all have the same angular momentum. But what happens is, as they spin more and more, as they get lower and lower energy, they spin more and more slowly. Sure. And the angular momentum is the same because the lever arm gets bigger, the spin gets, and, and the momentum gets less, and the effective, what you would call the mass, gets less, the mass of the photon, if it were confined gets less and the momentum gets less linearly okay but that's it's, right it's just the frequency it's just the frequency e is h new right so uh, th these things are not in contradiction with one another they're only in contradiction if you put them in different boxes if the spin isn't mass then you've made a statement where you're fooling yourself you've, you've, you've decided for yourself that spin isn't mass and, and therefore it's not mass but that's in here it's, it's not in nature that, that's that's it a distinction. It seems to me like the, the real strength of your model is that you can show what in, in normal QED, they don't say anything about what happens from one state to another. And with your integrating with quantum, I mean, with um, Maxwell's equations, you're able to do the whole timeline. And so I, I you should be able to take a photon in times normal time space and go to an orbital and be able to model it all the way through. Whereas with normal QED, it says nothing about what happens in between, or very little. Yeah, you're right. I think QED is an absolutely perfect theory in the bits where it's not talking about the endpoints, but right. talking about what it is, essentially, what the emitter and absorber are. It doesn't say that. It just treats them as featureless balls uh, that, that have a probability of emitting a photon. And when you do that, you get a perfect theory which you can calculate stuff from. But if you try and think about what the electron actually is, you end up with a mind full of featureless balls. So, um, and, 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 you know, if you're going to think in featureless balls, then featureless balls is what you're going to think about. And, and, and that's absolutely fine, because if you think about featureless charged point balls, that's pretty much what you've got as an electron in quantum electrodynamics. You have a featureless charged ball, infinitesimally small in your thoughts, which has a certain probability of emitting a photon. Then you invent a mathematics which allows you to create the photon and annihilate it with a certain probability. And that mutual probability is given by the fine structure constant. You then construct a mathematical theory on top of that, which includes the geometry of space time. And you have one of the two theories that humans have made up that doesn't have any contradiction at all with experiment. And it's magnificent, but it's just not complete. And what, right, it tells what you the thing what happens in between. Yeah, it does the in-between stuff. It doesn't do the in-between world of stuff. So that's why we need more. That's why physics isn't over. That's why we need more of this. So, um, I agree. Yeah. But but when you're looking at those diagrams, to try and come back to your original question, which I've really, you know, a long spiel about all sorts of things. When, when you're looking at the momentum of a, an individual... So, so what you've got is got a momentum going round and round. Now, what's it going round and round? It's going round and round itself. So, and what is itself? It's, itself is something that contains certainly electric field. That's what you see on the outside of an isolated electron. So you've got electric field. You've got some magnetic field in there as well, which came from the photon, but which may or may not have been transformed into something else. But you also have rest mass. You have a rest massive part. Both in, in my theory and the Dirac theory, you have mass in there as well. The way we put mass in, Dirac and I is different. Dirac puts it in as an extra term, a lump, and I put it in as a dynamical term, which transforms back and forth into other things. Um, however, it's still mass uh, and field. It's scalar, infamy, and bivector. <coughs> what is entirely in a bivector? It's in three bivector spaces. The bivector space of electric field, which is an aerial space, the bivector field of magnetic field, which is another aerial space, and the bivector field of momentum. But if you think about momentum, what's happening? In those diagrams, I have these little fog disks, which form the torus around which the thing goes. Those are not separate fog disks, they're all the same fog sphere. They just slices through the um, rest mass distribution. So they really should all be drawn at the same point in space. That's what the projection is. I put all those fog spheres, fog disk on top of them, and then draw the field with respect to the fog disk, not with respect to momentum space. 
and then you get the sphere at the core of what I'm projecting. So what I mean by a projection there, I'm having a look. But if if you want to think about what's happening in terms of the center of momentum, yeah, that's the thing. If you if you want to think about what's happening at the center of momentum, you have to imagine imagine you had something which had some momentum, a quantum bicycle, something out in space. This is where the bicycle thing comes from. So what you have is you have some um, and 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 you try. Imagine it's rotating around and around like this thing is doing. It doesn't have anything to rotate around but itself. It can only rotate about its own center of of momentum. The momentum. So so what happens is, you know, I'm drawing it as though it's rotating round and round like this. But a better way to do it would be to hold the, the fog core fixed like a railway line and make the object rotate around that in a quantum bicycle motion, in a very rapidly spin motion. So it projects onto a sphere because the thing has nothing but a sphere to, it only has itself, its own distribution, or whatever the stuff is that it's made of, to rotate around. So it has to be spherical. It absolutely has to be spherical because nothing else has this three-dimensional symmetry, which is not going to have the center of mass vibrating around about nothing. Center of mass, center of momentum, better said, has to stay still for a free electron in space. That means that it's a sphere in in, in space space. Now, I don't know what it is. I don't know if this is correct, but the way that I make sense of it is the way that you explain the emission and the absorption relativistically from the photon's point of view are the same instant in space time. So even though in momentum space it's doing this thing and wraps around so that the fields link up again perfectly, it's doing it at the speed of light. So relativistically, it's not moving any distance it's doing it in the same relativistically in the same spot even though it is actually coming around in momentum space i does it make sense what i'm saying it makes absolute sense on it's a very good way of looking at it um so, so another way to to say the same thing is to say okay let, let's now think relativistically we've got a photon going around and around in circles you know where's the circle well the whole circle is at the same point in space time and that's the end of it it just stays at the same point in space time and you have a sphere Equivalent or a point, if you like a, a, a point at its center. So one question that I do have is thinking about the difference between the electron and the proton in the way that you conceive of them as a trefoil. Yeah. So my question is, does that require that? Does the trefoil require tumbling as well, or does the motion through the trefoil cancel the magnetic field? The trefoil will have a field distribution associated with it, and that field distribution is something that has that it has to maintain as an energy. So it will require a tumble as well. It will tumble any way it can to try and get that total external energy down to a minimum, which means it will anti-tumble in phase with its internal rotation to be at a minimum energy. Right. So yes, it will also tumble. But its tumbling will be more complex than the tumbling of, a, of an electron. Would it be like kind of like a resonant tumbling, if you know what I mean? If you got the mass scales, if you look at the talk I posted yesterday, and you've got the mass scales of these things, what you're doing is you're taking something which is looping a photon, and making it go around and around in circles, and you end up with an electron. But if you take that thing, if you take an electron and make it go very fast, it looks just like a photon, it gets squashed to a disk, but, um, so traveling at, at 200 times its mass, you're traveling at nearly the speed of light. And then you can do the same thing again, you make that go around and have it as a resonance system. And that's what I think a muon is. And then you can do that again. But you can only do it three times because you, can, you only have three dimensions of space about which to rotate. So, um, and hang on, I never, I never understand. Hang on, I never that see that sounds new to me. I never, are you saying that the trefoil is really a confined photon that is tracing the trefoil? Shit. It's a continuum. No, um, no um, in, in fact, perhaps the trefoil is misleading. The thing is, what I think is happening in the proton is that you kind of have three knots or three paths, which each of which, and there are two different sorts of paths, there's an up path and a down path. So something which has, has a symmetry. But what, the property of both of these is they're incomplete paths. They're a path which takes something which is going in one direction and transforms it by a complete rotation to something going in a perpendicular direction. Now, once you have such objects, they're not complete, they're not full objects. So, so, so what I'm really thinking of is I'm thinking that one loop of the trefoil is some stuff going around that comes in, goes in in X and comes out in Y. Another loop of the trefoil does something similar, 
and then the third loop of the trefoil does something similar. But they yeah, need but, you to also, but you also call it that it call it a continuous flow. So then, what, why is yeah. it three things and not one thing? Um, because the initial things are by hypothesis things which are not continuous flows. They're flows that are a flow that does some complicated stuff, boom, but it ends up by, it does three lefts. It does something which brings the thing back from being something which is essentially a left turn, which is uh, in, in, in the electron, depending on how you look at it, you have four left turns or eight left turns going around the double loop. They go left, 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 left. That's all. Now the proton's much more complex. The proton has to mimic that to get a positive charge, but it cannot have a negative pivot. It has to be an object that has the same pivot as the electron. Now the electron pivot, if the electron charge is negative, is positive. The proton must also have positive pivot. Otherwise the pivots would annihilate and you'd have nothing at all, which is what happens an electron positron pair but for the proton in order to get something that looks like a left it has to do three rights in some way three left make a right so there's some complex loop in each arm of the trefoil that makes the thing go left 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 not left left but not four lefts three lefts and three lefts isn't a continuous particle but you can make a continuous particle from three three lefts a continuous positively charged particle what you do is you go x to y, y to z, z to x, and you need three of them, which is why you need three quarks. So, so when you're so, traversing the three quarks, you end up in the same initial point, right? Yeah, you, you come back to where you started from, and then you do it again, and you have a continuous yeah. loop, and you have a particle, and we call it the proton. And the pivot so is at that center point of where the three are meeting. That's right. The pivot is positive for the, uh, it's, it's sort of three lumps of pivot. But these oh, don't have to be the same point. Well, they don't have to be at the same point in space. They don't have to be. I don't know, Pete. I don't know whether because they could. I think they do kind of fold in on each other as much as they can, but, mm -hmm. but there are there are three separate paths. So that could be um, three centers of pivot, or it could be, or, or they could share that center, or it could have some slightly more complex shape than spherical inside. I, I actually honestly don't know until we model these things. I won't know this. This is just floating around in my head at the moment. My head is a very strange place to be. I'll explain that to people sometime. So, uh, so, uh, so, 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 I'm imagining this stuff moving in in multiple dimensions and folding in on itself and turning in and out and in multiple colours and red, green, and blue at least for these things. Mm. I was having a think on how to model some of these things recently, John. I've come up with an idea that might work for at least for visualising stuff, which would be a little bit simpler, which should help. Which is kind of funny. It, it is. I know you're simple. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 okay. So, but this, so the idea was rather than trying to superimpose everything, because that just becomes chaotic, yeah. is to. So I was just doing this in JavaScript, because then you can. It means that you can move. The idea was to have the four kind of three dimensional spaces in a grid. Mm -hmm. And each of those elements in the grid would be a little 3D plot. I told you I knew you're simple. Well, no, so, <laughs> but this is what I mean. Like, if you try to have all 60, uh, if you have to have, try to have all three dimensional spaces sat on top of each other, it just becomes crazy yeah. because it's very hard to see everything. So, what I was thinking was if you have those spaces kind of exploded out, so they're sat next to one another, but you gimbal lock the camera so that as you rotate, they all rotate together. So you can yeah. kind of have a consistent view on something. You can yes. then say, OK, I'll do, uh, I found a thing called a cone plot, which is actually a, a way of doing a 3D vector field. Yeah. And then all of the singlet elements you could do as a, um, a kind of uh, okay. a color yeah. density kind of volume plot superimposed on that vector field, which would allow you yeah. to get all 16, but as the sort of four exploded apart. Okay, that's even better than the axes, but yeah, that's the sort of thing you need. And if you look at that trefoil knot thing um, slide, um, yeah. then you see I put the cogs in there? Yeah. The cogs mean that everything has to be well, cogs and gears. It has to be linked in mm. a harmonic rotation. So, yeah. So, so, you, yeah. But the, 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 so that, that's the thing, though. The, the simulation would be linked. 
Yeah. Right. But be visualizing the simulation is a nightmare. So yeah. simulate as one superimposed easier. thing and then do a sort of exploded view. But then the, so what I've been working on is just the mechanism of like, is it possible to do that simply? Yeah, I know what you mean by <laughs> my, my definition is simple, but like, yeah. can I, can you explode that apart, but in such a way where you could just have a couple of controls at the side saying, okay, well, I want to look at this element of it. Um, the, the thing that I've got in my head is there's um, a bunch of websites that do multi-dimensional Rubik's cubes, believe it or not, where you have to rotate them through additional dimensions. So the whole thing's a nightmare, but you have little ways of saying, okay, we'll flip it through this dimension and you change your view by yeah. rotating through another dimension. And it's almost that kind of thing. You're sort of saying, okay, well, I want to look at this three-dimensional space out of my, or subspace out of my whole thing. And you can kind of flip through those um, to sort what of get- the the, What about the way the Solar Observatory does it, where they look at the sun through different filters, UV, ultraviolet, IR, different, you know? You That's kind of what I was sun. envisioning with those four side by side, because you'd have like, well, here's the electric, here's the magnetic, here's the- um, Well, that way, I mean, if you do, if you do, spin different, drop the, if you could drop the opacity on them and have the different colors there, you wouldn't even have to explode them out. You could have the option to do them superimposed, where you mm. could just click through the colors and see them. Yeah, I was th I was thinking about that, but the, then the uh, superimposing four three dimensional vector fields suddenly gets very <laughs> very confusing, yeah. um, unless they're doing completely distinct things, in which case this physical in the plot space for them to be kind of distinct from one another. But the idea of kind of giving you the flexibility to control that because the, that's the thing is that having it as one static rendered image is really hard because what you want is the ability to sort of pick it effectively pick it up and move it around because if it's it's almost like a sort of magic eye kind of picture eventually you're you're going to click on the right way to look at it and you'll be able to look at all of them and see them separately at which point you can put the, all four of them back together and kind of see what's happening but you need to be able to kind of take it apart look at it and kind of say okay is it that and kind of expand it and collapse it so you can see where things fit and i think, I think what you probably want to do is have three views of the three bits mm. and then a view of the center where they're crossing where, where stuff is crossing from one end to the other and it'll do that mm, that's true yeah do, yeah do that all at the same time so have the kind of exploded views and yes. the superimposed yeah, one uh, together then the central one where the things are coming look through the middle yeah. So, John, can I ask you this? So, I, 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 the the photon, the two photons making the electron seems reasonably clear to me in the momentum space. But how do you envision what goes into the proton? Two how photons. Much? Two photons. And it's just one yeah. proton, one continuous photon that goes all. You remember those beautiful diagrams of Dons? I think it's a bit. So the electron is one photon going around twice. So you're saying the proton is also one photon going yes. around. The whole trefoil twice for every wavelength. No, yes. I think, yes, that's right. Going around the whole, going, going, it goes around the whole trefoil once. The, the, the photon goes around the whole double loop once for every wavelength. But now the loop's going to be a much more complex roller coaster. You see, one second, you're saying the double loop around the trefoil once. No, like no, no, loop once per wavelength. For the electron, it's one wavelength in the whole double loop. Right. But the proton is one wavelength in the whole roller coaster ride round three forks and through the center and <laughs> finish one wavelength. So it's a so single thing. It's doing a lot more, like it's traveling a lot more distance. It's traveling a lot more configuration space. Yes. Far more complex configuration space because it has to go through loops to make you know, three lefts make a right. So it has to do three lefts make a right. Okay, now we can do three lefts make a right again. And now we can find another way to do three lefts make a right in such a way I mean, that... I think it's a stable particle. Think about all that. The, from my talk um, yesterday, day before yesterday now, only, not for you. Yes. For a proton, the, uh, the pivot force is much stronger, right? And the energies for pair production are also much higher, right? Yes, for, for, for a proton, one has quite a bit more pivot, uh, but also okay. quite a bit more energy. I thought that the pivot right. had to be the same for, pro, for the proton and the electron. Oh, no, there was the pro electron and the positron. The electron and the positron are the same. The proton has far more mass, 1,800 times as much mass. Right. 1,800 times as much pivot, 1,800 times at least. 
I've, I, I don't know what the, you, you know, I've, I've, we haven't modeled this yet. We're at, the, we're at the point where we've got something like the Dirac equation, but we don't have solutions to that. And the entire world community working on Dirac equation, which is simpler than the stuff we're doing. The, the, the solutions they were doing were simple quantum mechanical solutions, simple uh, complex wave function solutions. This is more complicated. It's going to take quite a bit of work. To get the, the, math, the maths is more complicated, but it gives you more guidance. Yes. Do you, the, so you, what you're doing with it is harder, but the it restricts you a lot more in what you can do. So you you've got a lot more helping you think through what is a a proper solution to it. And it's I think what this means is very smart young people with capabilities of modeling on computers and do things. And oh, we should go find some. Yeah, that would be good. I wonder where we could find some of those. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, we've got well, I, I, I updated my system and I got a little bit of a glitch with the booting process and I installed Rust and I installed Enius software. The nice uh -huh. thing you have next would have some make files and an example. Right now, um, the, oh, God. No, yeah. The exact, so, yeah, I've got examples, but they're um, in a. I'll t t tell you what, Pete. I'll, um, I'll send you. I'll, I'll upload the examples as a. I make them public because I've got a bunch of ones which are sort of demonstrating elements of John's maths or doing kind of uh, FDF and uh, all that kind of stuff. So I've got a bunch of examples with the Python library and a bunch with the, the Rust library. Um, right. but I hadn't really, because no one else other than me has really used it before, I hadn't really twigged it. Yeah, they're not with the main repository, so you can't see them. Yeah, I'm using um, the GitHub repository. Yeah, okay. So... Uh, which did you did you pull from uh, mine or the the fork that's on the Quisicle one? Uh, let me check. Because uh, mine is a bit is a little bit ahead because I'm there's I'm sort of occasionally I think tinkering I made with both things. Of, I made one from yours. Cool. Yeah, that's what. If you want to follow along with what I'm doing as I'm updating stuff, you should pull from mine. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll. I'm just making a cup of coffee. Actually, well, no. I'll tell you what, I will do it right now because the wonders <laughs> of Git means that it's pretty much instant. Um, so, if you give me a second. Yeah, oh, that's a good stopping point for this video recording. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, 